we, we still have five minutes to launch here, but you can tell I'm kind of like uh, ready to kind of get going. So we can do a little preliminary stuff. I'm curious, um, uh, who here is like doing PHP unit stuff on a, like a more or less regular part of, right? Certain amount. Uh, how about um, B hat? Certain amount of B hat going on, and uh, like Selenium or uh, Nightwatch. Uh, any any other testing frameworks that I have mentioned that people are using? Cypress. Cypress. And what does Cypress test? And. and So full stack yeah. across, yeah. And um, any like link checkers, uh, uh, load load uh, load testing, any some of that stuff, yeah, going out. Um, this isn't a, it, it, this isn't specifically a talk about testing, and we could you know that would be a great talk to have too, but um, but it, you can't really separate. Um, uh, delivery practices from testing. They're kind of bundle, bundled together. And uh, so mostly we'll be talking around the edges of these, um, these testing frameworks. Um, and so how many people here are on um, one of these like hosted um, uh, services that bundles uh, delivery like uh, Pantheon and platform.sh? And uh, I think at, you mentioned Azure is, has a bundled pipeline they have they have pipelines and and somebody also mentioned GitLab is I'm not familiar but GitLab also has like bundled pipelines so increasingly you don't have to build the stuff right the way we did a few years ago right because it's all right there you can buy it um, I think we're still up here right um, Uh, so we, uh, here's another, uh, I guess this is the um, little preview section, is that um, this slide deck is done in um, Remark.js uh, instead of using Keynote. It's the first time I've done a uh, Remark.js slide deck. And it's pretty cool, I like it, right? So it's, uh, and so it's sort of like a, um, uh, like a meta version of continuous delivery because it's like continuous delivery for the slide deck, right? <laughs> Because the because the uh, and I can I, we have a minute so I can show you that the um, right uh, yeah I don't know about the finding the screen but all right if I can slide that over here where is that I don't know why it doesn't I don't know if I can do my screen management it doesn't seem to show up over there it should be right there right yeah. Yeah, I can't really, so, but in any case, the whole uh, slide deck is just, um, uh, it's just Markdown, you know, it's Markdown in CSS, and, um, and it's just all pushed out to a website, it hangs off, it hangs off of a website, um, and so, um, and I could do the presentation from live, this is my, uh, my blog site, michaelgodek.com, and you can actually follow it on your, on a phone or a laptop. Um, you go to michaelgodek.com talks, and then there's this DrupalCon talk here. And then down at the bottom, there's a link to slides. And it's the same presentation that we're doing here, right? I'm just doing it from localhost, right? So it's, the same, it's actually the same kind of thing, but I suppose it's more reliable to do it from local. Um, and so it's uh, Remark.js with, um, uh, it uses uh, Adirondack is a CSS library, and um, uh, Descartes is another CSS library that does the typography. Um, and so what I'll do is I'll make, a, I'll make an additional slide that describes the technology that goes into the uh, slide deck, and I'll add it to the deck, and I'll, and I'll push it to the, to the deck afterwards. So um, we have that all out there. So looks like we're on time. So um, we're going to start, right? And so we're going to start with this question, right, which maybe I already know the answer to, but 
you know, have you ever pushed code to production only to wish that uh, you had known something first, right? Something that you only learned after you pushed. A few of you have had been in that situation. Um, how many post-mortems have you been into when it turned out that the cause of failure could have really easily have been avoided if you'd only known something first? And so, really, how would you like to be able to go back in time to be able to fix these things so that, like, they're fixed before anybody sees that? Well, you wouldn't be, really be the first person, right? This, uh, so, uh, he's going back, all the way back in the 18th century, there was this guy, an uh, Irish writer named Samuel Madden, and he published the first time travel story that I've ever uh, heard of, right? He was uh, 1728, uh, he was thinking about this stuff. He wrote this book called Memoirs of the 20th Century. And he didn't really have the technology angle to work with, and so he had a guardian angel go, go into the future. And his guardian angel goes to 1998, would have placed him in the Clinton administration, right? And he finds these diplomatic letters, I guess there were Madeleine Albright's, and he brings them back to 1728 to correct some you know, mistakes that people were about to make, right? You know the story. So um, that was pretty cool, going back. And that was a century before, like Charles Dickens did a rip, um, uh, uh, Christmas Carol, um, and, or what is it, yeah, Christmas Carol, and then uh, Washington Irving did Rip Van Winkle, and then you know now we're in like, we got Doctor Who, Back to the Future, Twilight Zone, Black Mirror, everything beyond. Well, the news here, really, is that the company I work for, which I can't tell you the name of it for legal reasons, has got a product called Time Orchestration, right? It's gonna really beat all of these CD tools because you're gonna be able to orchestrate time to go back and fix the things before they actually happen. And we've got a few approval issues with the FDA about this product, but we're working on it. And I've seen it with my own eyes. Other people in this room have seen it as well, although they might not admit to it. Uh, but while we're working out the kinks about how this time travel stuff works, then the, you know, the next best thing to time travel is um, getting to know something sooner. And that's what we're gonna talk about here for the next half an hour, is this uh, poor man's version of time travel, this continuous delivery. Um, so I'm Michael Godek. I'm from a uh, little town in uh, Texas, just east of San Antonio. And I work for this architecture and engineering group in a global pharma organization where um, we really have a very big appetite to know a lot of things sooner because there's a lot of stuff that we really wish we had known a just a little bit sooner. So we're, work we're working really hard on, on uh, these kinds of uh, problems. We're putting a lot of resources into it. And so I wanted to address at least this one part that you might wonder, you know, if the problems of like a global giant, really, how relevant that they could be with you. I just spoke with a lot of you, and a lot of you are really just getting started on a CD path. And we've got a lot of resources going into it. We've got some amazing talent that works on it full time. But um, the playing field is really a lot more level than you think, right? Because in a large organization with a lot of resources, we have a lot of things that are going against us that are just the nature of being in a large organization that being in a small organization, you don't have those same problems. You can make decisions for yourself. You can solve your own problems. And so um, we all face different problems, but the question of getting faster feedback, of knowing things sooner, right? This is the common ground that I, I wanna um, focus on here. And in software practice, we call that continuous delivery, right, as a practice. And so just to provide kind of a, a definition of it is that, um, because there's a lot of confusion. We talk, there's a lot of discussion around DevOps. Uh, there's continuous delivery um, uh, pipeline is a set of tools and protocols that you use to control the quality of changes to production. And so even if all you have is a checklist that's written down on the back of a napkin, then you've got to start, right? That's your protocol for, for delivering, right? And so if you can, um, if you have some protocols without tooling, that could actually be more valuable than having a lot of tooling without really clear protocols, right? So start, start with just understanding what it is that you're trying to get done and get those protocols done. Um, now I've done uh, sessions on continuous delivery at DrupalCon Austin and Amsterdam 2014. 
uh, Drupal South Melbourne in 2015, and there's a QR code to that um, YouTube video there. Um, and things have changed a lot in those last five years. You can buy a lot of the things that we had to build five years ago. Um, and so this talk isn't really about like the state of the art of build automation, but really just to uh, try to get your thinking about uh, CD to uh, not be so much around automation, uh, but thinking of it in terms of uh, the way you go about improving your business practice, which is really what it is we're trying to get at with CD. Um, and then we talk about um, s continuous delivery as agile successor that came off of a talk by a uh, Andrew Binstock of Byte Magazine a number of years back. And it implies that agile has become the standard of practice and that like in responsible hands it's effective and I believe that. So I'm taking that as a given for this group and we won't talk about it much. And leaving aside like the problem of fake agile frameworks, um, if we're just looking at the agile manifesto, right? You can print it out on a single piece of paper. You don't need a book or a PhD. Embracing change, coding in short sprints, an emphasis on automated testing, you know, all of those things have really helped us all improve in quality and productivity. Um, and a central problem that Agile has been very effective at is adapting to changing customer requirements. And so when we have a realistic grasp of Agile, then that's getting to be more and more something that we do well. But the problem of uh, maintaining quality and delivery is still very uh, complex and elusive problem, even for people that have put a lot of resources into it. And for all of the enthusiasm around DevOps, uh, the delivery practices are still very much in the early days, right? Agile is pretty mature, but the delivery practices, I think that um, we have years of work to do um, to get there. And so um, I'd like to take you to back in time a bit, right, to, to look at this pre-internet period um, and look at lean practice before the era of the internet, especially uh, at the Toyota production system. And so a few years ago, I went to Japan. I went to uh, Kyoto like everybody does, and I visited shrines. But I also visited the um, Toyota Museum in Nagoya, which is like a shrine in lean practice itself. And the curators they went beyond making a uh, mere showcase to inventions that you might um, expect, but they tell a story of innovation as a process. So they tell the story, they take you back to 19th century Japan where these manually operated wooden shuttlecock looms were the cornerstone of the economy, and there was this teenager, Sakashi Toyoda, who was really fascinated by how these things work. He thought about it a lot, he put his mind to it, and he developed a model that you could operate with one hand, which was a big improvement to productivity. That was 1890, he got his patent for that. And in the following years, he iterated relentlessly. And he came with a number of, a number of great designs, including uh, uh, the first uh, sh automatic shuttle change loom in 1903. So when the spool runs out, you didn't need any hands, it would automatically shift one on. And so that was a long and prodigious series of advancements that his competitors sought to copy. And Toyota famously said, um, quote, the thieves may be, uh, it was, what happened was that people were stealing his designs and his colleagues asked him what they were supposed to do about these patent violations. And he'd said, the thieves may be able to follow the design plans and produce a loom, but we are modifying and improving our looms every day. They don't have the expertise gained from the failures it took to produce the original. We do not need to be concerned. We need only continue as always making our improvements. Right, so Toyota's insight into the value of learning from failure and persistence in making improvements, right, that's the foundation of lean uh, practice today. So that stretches all the way back to 120 years ago, 130 years ago. And so the story goes on this, the, in kind of an exercise of recursive innovation, because this family just continued to innovate. And in, uh, in the 1920s, they sold out of their business. They sold all the patents to, their, to, their, to the loom technology that they developed. They created a new company named Toyota with a, with a T, and the family name was with a D, and they launched into the automotive industry, that, which was already dominated by American and European manufacturers. And they came into it with decades of metal casting experience. They thought it was really gonna, they were gonna excel in this particular area but the uh, defect rate of their early engine box was just horrendous, and there wasn't any guarantee of success, and of course we know that you know, they did actually 
uh, pull out of that. And the, the process that they pioneered at Toyota was uh, eventually championed in the West, the way we know about it, through, was through the work of W. Edward Deming, um, who was assigned to work with Toyota in the post-World War II period, in the reconstruction period. And he was a statistician, a management consultant, and just an all-around really great guy. And Deming was a catalyst for the science of productivity. And he merged this culture, this culture of Toyota that already exists with his, his own American culture that's identified with Benjamin Franklin of innovation and in invention, and with his own really unique contribution of applied statistical analysis that Deming brought to the thing. And so these early uh, Japanese auto imports to the US were cheap and low quality but the fusion of Deming and Toyota and other contributors produced what became to be known as the Toyota production system. And so Deming's, you know, through his course of his life, at the end of his life, his notoriety was limited to like management circles about when Ronald Reagan awarded him the National Medal of Technology. And this generated uh, publicity um, that sparked a series of articles and interviews uh, with Deming. He was 87 years old then, that was 1987. He was born in 1900. And his unpretentious optimism, his vitality, resonated with people working beyond spheres of manufacturing where he was known, including uh, software thought leaders at the time. Um, his books were the cornerstone of the 1970 manufacturing revolution of just-in-time delivery. And his uh, 1982 book, uh, Quality, Productivity, and Competitive Position, provides really a perspective of lean theory about the time when it, it intersected with uh, software um, development. And so this lean, lean manufacturing conception of just-in-time delivery was really, when it came to America, it was often misinterpreted by the American bean counters as merely a technique to reduce inventory carrying costs. But software thought leaders recognized the essential value of establishing a systematic way of quickly capturing and correcting defects. And they restated this quality assurance principle as a new standard of practice called continuous integration. And that was popularized in 1999 uh, by Kent Beck's book, uh, Extreme Programming Explained. All right, came directly out of this. Um, so we'll take, let's take a step back and we'll look at how the, um, the assembly line in the Toyota production system informed the software delivery practices. Because the first time to run this Toyota production system in the US was the Toyota GM joint venture uh, at the NUMI plant in Fremont, California. And uh, that was in 1984. And this same plant is the Tesla Motors factory today. And so it was the GM plant. It was this NUMI joint vent, GM Toyota joint venture. And now it's Tesla. So it's an awesome building. It has a lot of stories to tell in that building. Um, so this GM plant in the 70s had the highest defect rate of any automotive plant in the, 19, in the 1970s, which is saying something, right? And they were producing the Chevy Celebrity in the old Cutlass Sierra until it, finally they shut the plant down because the quality was just so bad, right? Um, and there was a, a UAW worker from that plant who had said, quote, uh, I can't remember any time in my working life where anybody asked for idea, my ideas to solve the problem. There's nobody to pull you out at General Motors, so you're just gonna let something go. Hundreds of misassembled cars never stop the line, was the motto at GM, right? Just keep pushing things into production. And it may sound odd, but it's like a lot of, some organizations I've been into, pushing code into production basically has that kind of feel to it. Like push to production, right, don't stop. So when taking over the Fremont plant, the Toyota insisted on retaining the same union workforce that GM blamed for the quality problems, right? GM shuttered the plant because of these terrible workers, right? And the Toyota's, uh, the, the GM guys warned the Toyota team. They said, okay, we understand. You're from Japan. You're naive, right? You just don't understand really how bad Americans can be. And so Toyota took these, uh, work, these uh, United Auto Workers from the failed Numi plant in Nagoya, and they showed them how the plant is run and Toyota production system. And these UAW workers were shocked to find that under Toyota, they would have the power to like sh uh, shut down the line over a quality issue, right? They had the authority as an individual. Anybody on the plant floor had the authority. So in the Toyota production system, you have these pull cords over every workstation. You pull once and it turns on an amber light. Manager comes over immediately to inspect whatever the issue is. And if they couldn't resolve it immediately, second pull shuts down the whole line. That is the foundation of what CI is 
in our system, right, where we push code in to some process that we run a bunch of tests, that's the equivalent of the and done cord from, uh, from the Toyota production system. So this thing about finding and fixing defects in real time, it seems like common sense, but it, there was a time when it was like not really the pattern and it really made radical improvements to car manufacturing and it brought, brought radical transformation to how we build and deliver software. Um, and so identifying defects sooner is gonna save a lot of time and money. That's pretty obvious, right? Um, and it should be enough to, to justify uh, investing in DevOps. But when you consider that um, every brake fix that you're looking at is an opportunity to discover root cause and to take action to try to prevent the same kind of uh, defect to occur in the future, that's really what you're after. That's even a bigger value than the cost savings of just finding and fixing things before they get to production. And so if you think about that uh, quote from Toyota, when he said, um, they don't have the expertise gained from failures it took to produce the original, right? It's like he was looking at the whole thing of like the learning process of examining defects, right? And Toyota plant, when they went from having the end on cord pulled 1,000 times a day to 700 times a day, was that a, do you think that was a positive or negative metric, right? When it happened, the Toyota management brought the team in and they said, what's wrong, right? The reduction in the num number of times that the end on cord was pulled was not taken as a positive thing, right? Nobody was getting criticized for stopping the line. So uh, learning from our defects, that's what's really allows us to improve our process. Our commitment to improving the process is what sets us apart from our competitors. So if you look at it from the perspective of um, lean theory, right, you can uh, spend you know, three years getting a Six Sigma certification, or you can take uh, three points from my talk and consider the job done, okay? And that is that, um, one, um, uh, Lean focuses on identifying what creates value from the perspective of the customer. So that's the first thing. You know, look at it from the perspective of the customer. What is it that creates value for them? Two, understand the process that creates that value and delivers that value. And so that's CD practice, right? Step three, finally, never give up on making that process work better. So if you do those three things, you can skip the Six Sigma certification and just call yourself a lean practitioner, right? Those are, the, those are all the principles you really need um, in order to um, understand how to uh, make the most out of a CD pra your CD practice as you build it out. And so then you have this issue of like, Deming, if you read Deming, it's like he constantly comes back to this question of fostering creativity, right? That if you really want to understand what's wrong with your organization, what's holding you back, then you need people to feel free to think in, un, in an unrestrained way, uh, to not, never have any fear of calling out defects or being caught for being the source of a defect, right? Defects in the in Toyota production system it's always an opportunity to move forward, right? So if you have a culture where it's like people are afraid of what's gonna happen if they're the cause of a break, then that's gonna be a problem. Um, how many people are familiar with uh, the Netflix Chaos Monkey, right? So yeah, it's pretty broad. So Chaos Monkey, they run this process in their, in their build pipeline that just goes and shuts down services and closes ports at random, right? It tears out your certificates and stuff. And, you're, and so it's like a, pushing software into the build. This is like the regular build process, right? It's like a game. And so if you don't have a sense of humor, then you, there's no way you're gonna survive at Netflix, right? It takes, there's, a, there's a certain attitude about this stuff. It's like, it should be, there should be something that's like fun about this. And if, uh, if the build pipeline is like soul crushing, then you wanna take a step back and think about it. Um, so the build pipeline is where you formalize the ways that your team responds to errors and you know, creates a context where you're not just fixing things but learning and uh, improving the delivery practice in the process. Um, and so it takes us back. The reason why we're all doing this, right, the first principle of the Agile Manifesto is you know, our highest priority is to satisfy the customer through early and continuous delivery of valuable software, right? And that's a principle. That's the practice of CD. Um, the kind of the canonical reference to that is this 
book by uh, Jez Humble and David Fairley, Continuous Delivery. And so there's a lot we could talk, right? Another 45 minutes into that, but there's, they talk specifically about configuration management, which is really hard under Drupal. And so we have a tremendous amount of work to do in that. Configuration is gonna be one of the biggest hurdles to uh, running a, a good CD pipeline. Uh, uh, feature toggles, there's discussion of that and other things. So um, it's a great read all the way through, highly recommended. So to try to kind of wrap things up, uh, I wanna give you um, three um, metrics, kind of high level metrics that you can look at to um, tell how well your little poor man's time machine is running. And they are, um, one is to ask yourself the question, um, are you really testing integration? Like what is it you're testing and are, in particular, are you really testing integration? Two, are your stages actually bolted together? And three is like who's ha what hands have to be on deck for delivery and who's making the call? Um, those three questions will take you a long way down the road. So the first one, um, are you testing uh, integration? Um, so CI is the first step of CD, and that's where you know, code's built every time there's a commit. And the, the, the value of CI is faster feedback. And so um, if you have pipelines where the dev instance is unattended in a broken state for any period of time, then you, know, you may have some build automation, but you know, what are you doing? I mean, what's the point of that? You should have a rule that uh, of the, the amount of minutes that, a, that a, an instance should stay in a, in a broken state. And whoever pushes a commit should uh, attend to see what the result of that is and if they can't fix it, if they break the build, if they can't fix it in 10 minutes or whatever you decide, then they should roll it back, right? Fix or roll back, never leave broken. Um, so Jez Humble sarcastically remarked, uh, there's two words in CI, continuous and integration, right? Continuous means more often than you think, and integration means uh, trunk, right? The branch of code that you're going to deliver to production. So those are two kind of really big challenges in that way. If you're, build, if you're working on long-term feature branches, which I think is pretty common in this community, then uh, you're probably not doing like many, many commits through the course of the day. You're probably not using feature toggles. Um, and those are, those are practices that you, aspirational practices that you can look forward to. Um, and if you're, uh, you're testing before you merge, then is that really testing integration? because the merge is integration. That's what merge means, is integration, right? Um, so what we're looking for in, in, in CI are small, frequent pushes where, we're test, where we have uh, fast running tests. And so Martin Fowler um, put it this way. He said, quote, one of the challenges of an automated build and test environment is you want your build to be uh, fast so that you can get fast feedback, but comprehensive takes, tests take a long time to run. So a, a, a deployment pipeline is a way to deal with this by breaking your build into stages. Each stage provides increasing confidence, usually at the cost of ex, extra time. Uh, early stages can find most problem by, problems by yield, yielding a faster feedback, while stages, uh, later stages provide slower, more thorough probing. So deployment pipelines are a central part of continuous delivery. That's the Martin Fowler quote. So think about that phrase, uh, each stage provides increasing confidence, right? Think of the stages of a pipeline as being bolted together. Uh, what are the bolts? What bolts these things together, right? They're, they're the, the, the protocols that you put in place, the quality assurance contracts that you say, when something's done with dev, then these things are guaranteed. We're gonna move it on to the next stage. And when it's done with that next stage, we're going to extend our guarantee on what it is that's tested. And when it moves to the next stage, then our, our guarantee is broader than that. So if you're testing a feature branch on an on-demand environment, it can be helpful. But if the code path from local to production is not consistently running across the same stages with the same guarantee protocols every time, then um, uh, you're vulnerable to the kind of inconsistencies that we're trying to resolve in this thing. And then finally, you know, who's supposed to be involved in the production release, right? So you're, the ideal that we're shooting for is that you can, have, you can give a non-technical stakeholder a green button and a red button, and you show them the stuff that's on stage ready for delivery, 
and if they like it, they can push green, and they shouldn't need any technical assistance for that to be delivered, and you shouldn't really even need people on call for delivery. And uh, if there's anything that goes wrong with it, then they should be able to press the red button, and it rolls it back, and they also shouldn't need um, uh, people on call to do that. And so that's one of the things, if, like if you're starting to build um, a delivery pipeline, really one of the first things that you should do is to write a rollback protocol. V very first, not, don't wait, right? Write your ro rollback protocol at, at the very beginning because it's the beginning of this practice all the way through. Um, and if you're, um, if you're a small shop, you've got limited resources, um, you're even working solo, you can still embrace all of these goals, right? Because if your pipeline is just a few bash scripts with a few well-considered tests guarding each stage, then that can be a more proper uh, pipeline than some overblown uh, DevOps operation with Kubernetes running and stuff that never seems to get like every, all their ducks like lined up in a row before things go to production, right? So the, the important thing about uh, having a CD pipeline is knowing what your protocols are and applying those protocols as you move stuff across to, to production. And the automation assists in all of that, but your automation is not your delivery pipeline, right? Your protocols are a more important part of it. And you don't need a budget in order to set your protocols. You can do that without budget, right? So um, I don't know if there, I don't know exactly where we're on time. Hopefully I have time for a few questions. Uh, thanks for coming out. Certainly come to the uh, code contribution sprints, sprints on Friday. Um, the slides are there, and that QR code goes to the slides. And again, I'll update the slides for the uh, technology that goes into the slide deck. And there's a bunch of other posts on my site that are kind of related to this whole topic area. Um, so thank you. And any questions? Anybody want to? Yes, no, maybe so. Thank you. What's that? That was a crazy new